Uh, Steve O'Neill is the mental health for liaison for Open Notes. He's also a Boston Red Sox fan. Uh, Steve is the social work manager for psychiatry, primary care, pain management, and infectious diseases, as well as the associate director of the ethics support service at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. In addition to that, Steve is a clinical instructor in the Department of Social Medicine and a faculty associate in the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. These presentations and experiences about doing mental health notes is one of the most sought after presentations about open notes today. So I'm excited that he's here joining us. So Steve, take it away. Great, thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, so I'm gonna be talking and my role, which Liz described uh, is I oversee all the behavioral health and mental health practices at our, uh, at our institution here. So we're a large urban, um, uh, center that draws a huge population from all around the Boston area. Um, but it's also, I will mention my background is not just as a clinical social worker, but also in bioethics. Um, that uh, in uh, 1998, when we started an ethics program at our hospital, um, we had a, um, uh, uh, in our program, we made all of our consultations immediately accessible to any patient or family member involved in an ethics consult. And um, from that experience, uh, the, that, um, that really paved the way for me to be really moving towards uh, transparency in that way. And I will say, kind of on the, in the heels of what Gil was mentioning, um, that, that when we um, started uh, opening up our notes in, uh, in ethics, um, we found there was a 50% decrease in phone calls to our legal department for the first two years that we ran that we started this program. And I think a lot of it was because we were heading things off in the past and finding ways to collaborate and partner with patients and their families around highly charged, often litigious kind of situations or potentially litig litigious situations. So we've moved from there. And I think that's a little of where a lot of my staff have kind of ascribed to the notion of opening up notes in this way. Uh, next slide, Amanda. Good. Thanks. So I have no uh, uh, conflicts to report. Next slide. So this is really about five years of impression. So the very first uh, mental health notes in, uh, really in the globe were opened up at our hospital at Beth Israel, which is one of the first uh, centers that opened up medical medical notes. Uh, you know, in, back in 2010. Uh, and then we went uh, live 2014 with all of uh, primary care and then all of the specialty services. And we had the option of adding uh, behavioral health and mental health and psychiatry and social work. We decided that we would open up our notes in conjunction with that rollout as well. Um, so, and I would think for those that uh, are uh, in the behavioral health area, to, to think about this as a little, it's another form of narrative therapy. Um, and if you think about Leah's uh, example, I mean, that wonderful letter that was shared, um, that, that her, her ability, if we sequestered those notes, she's seeing, and by her own letter, says she sees a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And why would those notes be any less available, or should they be any less available to her, her than they would be for all the other services that she sees? And that's part of where we're trying to think about what are we seeing five years now of experience uh, down the road, and that's what I'm going to share a little bit about the implementation process and what that's been like. Um, bottom line, I will say that, in fact, actually, all the fears that staff had, all the anxiety that they've had, the anxiety is still there a little bit, but I would say basically it's been remarkably quiet, both here at Beth Israel as well as around the country uh, for places that have opened up notes. So next slide. So we were asking the same three questions that basically were on the medical side. You know, would open notes help patients become more engaged? Uh, would it be the straw that breaks the therapist back in terms of more work burden? Uh, and after one year, uh, would patients and therapists want to continue? Same things. So next slide. And we always start with what is best for the patient. And I think a lot of the problem we have in healthcare is many of the systems we have are really provider-centric, not patient-centric. And so this is really, as Liz mentioned at the very outset, patients have a right to access to their record. And all we are really doing is just making that access easy and available for them. Uh, and I would add, if you think about Leah's example, there's a, there's a uh, rule that we use, it's a 70-30 rule, um, that when a patient comes to a well visit, when you go for a, a good physical exam, when everything's going fine, 
the rule of thumb is that generally patients remember about 70% of what's told to them in the, in the session or what's talked about there. That still means they have huge gaps and miss a lot of what, what is there. So if they can look back and see what was there in the note, that really helps them. And then you take patients where there's a lot of uh, high anxiety or there's bad news being delivered. How much does somebody take in there? We know that generally patients will report to us and the literature shows that they only remember about 20 to 30% of what's there. So that's the flip of the 70, 30, if you will. So this is really, I think Open Notes is really about what's best for the patient and moving the, moving the dial to really engage them more. Next slide. So in, back five years ago, we started in both psychiatry and social work, and we had um, I started psychiatry, did it as a 10 patients apiece, and then ramped up eventually. And in social work, I gave staff the option uh, for they could, um, they could uh, opt out altogether if they really felt uncomfortable. They could do a ramp up model, just similar to what uh, psychiatry did, where they tested it out with a cohort and then built up, and, or they could do a full on, um, uh, you know, just open up all their notes all together. And we did it not retroactively. This is from the start date of that uh, that we had from either March or April five years ago. Next slide. So we had 15 psychiatrists and therapists in the psychiatry department, so we started with only the faculty. Um, and then we had 29 social work staff who agreed to the pilot. Five were in, you know, to, to be tested out. Five declined. We did not include pediatric therapists. So for the purpose of this, this is really around adult and ambulatory care. Um, so we had 24 that participated. Right, right now, we have better than 4,000 patients that are participating in open therapy notes. So that's over the last five years now, and that's what we have currently uh, existing. Next slide. These are the fears. You can imagine the fears that would be in any place, right? What's the, it's gonna increase the word, work burden, the feeling a sense of pressure to get my notes entered in a timely manner so that they can be useful to the patient. And for me as a manager as well, uh, that to me is actually, I want my staff to be a little bit anxious about getting their notes in a timely way. So that's a pretty good thing for administration, uh, et cetera. Then there was the worry about misunderstanding. I'm concerned about patients misunderstanding information in the notes. And then on the other hand, I'm hopeful that the open notes may actually enhance the therapy process and promote greater communication and understanding at both sides. Many therapists reported that they were worried about patients reading the notes alone. Um, and so, you know, not, and not having a place to process that if they didn't understand things. And all of that will be addressed. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, staff were also worried that they're going to have to relanguage all the notes and because patients will be angry about certain content and what's going to happen when they don't have a place to, do, to, to deal with that. And there was a lot of worry about uh, severely mentally ill patients, particularly uh, those that are psychotic or paranoid, that they will flee therapy. It'll have a chilling effect. Um, and we, did not, we have none of that's been borne out. Um, it's it's a quote here. It's one thing to tell them in a session that we think they're having a paranoid thoughts and another for them to read it at home alone. Next slide. We did uh, exclude domestic violence patients uh, because of the safety exclusion, but that's generally true in all places that we, um, we tend to not most domestic violence programs um, or uh, violence prevention safety programs usually do not build, do build for visits partly because if the perpetrator uh, for that happens to be the, the healthcare subscriber, they can get a notification that the person is seeking services and just the seeking of services can at times increase uh, the risk for that person. So most all programs kind of eliminate domestic violence, but we've also dealt with that on the side for those patients that end up in therapy that start and come in with one issue and then we find that there's something else going on there. So we have to, you have to think about carefully uh, documenting those aspects. And we always have to think about, you know, who's the note intended for? Who's going to read it? Because we have to fulfill our, we get audited as a teaching hospital. We get audited routinely and regularly by our insurance companies and by Medicare. Um, so we have to think about both making sure we've met our standards, but we also document both for ourselves, for our patients, and for any of our covering staff uh, and the emergency department if our patients end up there. So... We had a lot of worry about obsessive patients who, uh, the quote I think about, I've spent my whole life learning not to double think. When I go to the mechanic, I don't want to look under the hood. Same here. And that's, you know, so there are patients where, you know, we know that they have simply chosen for their, for good reasons, not to look at the notes. Um, and that's okay. So we have to kind of respect what they would like to do and what feels best for them. 
And then paranoid petri- patients, I'd be terrified, petrified to look, and I'm not going to do it. And I will say that is a quote from one of my own patients. And um, that patient took him two years to be able to look at the notes. He was scared and silly that I would have written that he was a horrible, uh, nasty person. And when he finally saw what, read one of his notes, he saw that it was not what I, what I was focused on. You know, that I focus certainly on his the struggles that he has, but also on all of the uh, the good attributes that he does have and his resiliency. And that was really reassuring for him because he was sure that I would just replicate what his family has always told him about how, how horrible a person he is. Um, and then we have uh, patients that uh, they, they um, um, uh, can't quite read the bottom part there. I'm having trouble reading that. Oh, in denial that they, yeah, in denial, if they read their diagnosis and see that, would they be upset about that? Um, and I think generally what we've been finding certainly is that patients, you know, know their diagnosis, they can see their diagnosis and they have a right to that already. Um, so by not sharing that, the, the diagnostic impressions, we're sometimes uh, leaving patients in a, in a little bit of a loss. And I think there's ways to to do that where we share with patients. Like I think about a, a paranoid patient of mine who is, um, uh, his view of what was going on, a very psychotic patient, actually. Um, what I simply write in my note is I show him as I write down his view of what's happening, and then I write down what I believe is going on. Uh, and most most of my paranoid patients feel that that's very respectful, that I've captured what they want, but I've also included what I think is clinically going on. Next slide. So when we had this, uh, we started a social work therapist work group we had with all the therapists getting together because we were worried we we're going to have to have um, a thesaurus for approaching for altering our language. Uh, and we had developed uh, frequently FAQs for, for all of the staff, including the, like the front desk staff. We have to make sure because they many of our patients would approach them and our front desk staff needed to be on the same page with, uh, with everyone. So we did FAQs for, for the therapists, for the uh, front desk staff, and for the patients that we distributed. All of that, by the way, is on our website and the, under the mental health section in Open Notes. And you can download that anytime. And as uh, Gil mentioned about plagiarizing anything we got there, anything we have out there, you can just you know, plagiarize away if it's helpful to you. Um, so we had to anticipate all the reactions and the feedback from patients and colleagues and staff. That work group, disbanded after two and a half months. Um, and what they found, the reason was that they found they did not need to do a thesaurus approach and start to alter the language. Many staff do report that they sometimes used more plain language, um, you know, that there were some uh, issues, but what most of us found was that we started to write our notes better. They were more readable rather than just clinging, clinging to some of the language that we sometimes get taught in in, uh, in schools that um, that are sometimes we want to show off our, our, our acumen in that way. Um, so I think our notes are actually better. They're more readable for our, all of our, uh, for the other disciplines as well. Um, so that's, that's, that's all part of the aspect of that. Um, when this first came out, there was, uh, we had a lot of publicity about opening up the mental health notes and uh, predominantly probably close to 90% of the um, feedback that we got from uh, when articles came out about about this uh, was that we were ruining psychotherapy, that we were really messing up the fiduciary relationship that we as clinicians have. Um, and I think uh, what we're seeing across the country now with uh, some of Steve Dobsch's uh, work at the VA, where they've been uh, setting the effect on mental health and our own work um, and, you know, and uh, research on this area too at Beth Israel, we're seeing just the opposite. We're not seeing any of those effects. Um, there was a lot of criticism. This was only helpful for high-functioning, well-educated patients. And we find that, in fact, actually a lot of our uh, patients who are more frail um, in, in both psychiatrically or medically, they use these notes a lot to kind of remind themselves of what they're trying to do and what they're trying to work on. I have a couple of patients of mine that routinely print out my notes after sessions. They put them on their refrigerator or somewhere in their house. Uh, and they look at that as a reminder of what they're supposed to be working on. So it's kind of their the Linus's blanket that they get to take with them uh, wherever they are. Um, and that's been quite remarkably helpful. Uh, next slide. So when we found patients were very pleased, 90% uh, of our patients agreed that opening up therapy notes is a good idea. Um, better than 85% of patients want to continue having their notes available. 
and very few said that it made them feel judged, worried, or offended. Now, if you look at those numbers there, like less than 15% felt judged and then worried and, uh, and offended. Those aspects, there were some patients, and if you think about the way that therapy works, there's always that in the beginning of any therapeutic relationship when it's first starting, patients always worry about, is this therapist going to understand me? Are they going to appreciate my, my aspects? What am I going to do with all of that? And will they really uh, see that? And what patients really are telling us is they're looking for concordance between what we say in the office and does it match what we've written in the note. And when the patients can see that what we've written in the note matches what we've said, that is really reassuring. And if there's not concordance, that's when the patients actually feel a little bit more judged or worried. Um, it's kind of like what happens on the medical side when, uh, when physicians or nurses write that somebody is struggling with morbid obesity and the patient never heard that term. You know, they've had discussions about being a large person. And, you know, it's when you explain to them that you have to use that term as offensive as it is uh, because it's for billable reasons. It's actually for um, auditing reasons. Uh, they understand that. So if we're just transparent about the reasons why we're saying something, that's what's really helpful. And that really helps them to feel more uh, respected and I think collaborative in that way. Uh, the adverse effects that we thought would, would be there have just not mis uh, materialized. Most of what we've had in, in our system, our notes are integrated. Uh, they're right in the middle, middle of the medical record. So our notes are, you'll find them in the medical record. They're not in a separate system. So, uh, so if um, Kerry, if I was seeing one of Kerry's patients in his practice, my notes would be right in there with the primary care practice in that way. And uh, you know that most patients more worry about not open notes, but about privacy, about who gets to look at the issues that they have. That's actually more of an issue in that in that regard. And then sometimes when we what we found is that patients sometimes misinterpreted some aspect. But that's important for us to then just be able to clarify that. Um, and again, as I mentioned, concordance was the other really big issue. Next slide. So the vast majority of patients never mentioned to their therapist about having read their note, and the therapist never asked the patient about if they had read their note. This is one a study that we're about to publish about, about this. And it's um, it, what's interesting about that is in therapy, we generally train, most of the therapists were trained to kind of wait for the patient to ask about something. Uh, so it was kind of ironic that here we open up this whole program and the therapists are waiting for the patients and the patients are waiting for the therapist to say something. So we think there's a little bit of a missed opportunity on, on both sides there. And I think that's incumbent for the therapists that we need to change the way that we approach that in that way. Uh, there is a reading rate drop off that is different than on the medical side. And I think that that's really largely due to the redundancy of our notes. A lot of our notes, particularly for ongoing therapies, are pretty redundant. So it's not surprising that our, a lot of our patients read them a little less often after that. Next slide. So, and a lot, most practices always worry about the nightmare patient. There's always some, what I found in our own practices here, um, is that some of my staff were talking about the nightmare patient. If we open up their note, it's gonna be horrible. These are labor intensive patients, no matter what you do. Um, and so this is, uh, so I don't think it really changes that aspect. And in fact, they became contagious. A lot of my staff were talking about the very same patient, some of which was not theirs. They weren't involved in it, that that was the worry that they have, but it doesn't change the, that. And I think we have to study a little bit more whether in fact, actually it might mitigate some of the labor intensity for them. Next slide. So it's really a contagious and next slide, yeah, they're, they're respected. So this is better than 50% felt more in control of their care, better, better at self-care, better at remembering, more engaged and better able to trust their therapist. So we think this really opening the notes on the therapy side really launches them in that way. Next slide. So they wanted to continue and they felt it would interestingly would affect their choice of future choice of therapists. Um, it would be affected if they were a choice between an open notes therapist uh, and a non uh, and a therapist who's not participating. And not one therapist or patient has asked the staff and all the rest of my staff have asked to join except for two who are very close to retirement and just asked them. They don't want to be bothered with that, but that's it. But everyone else has opened up and they're fully opened up now at this point. Um, the other aspect about this is the stigma. If we um, don't open up mental health notes uh, along with the other, the other notes, we usually do because we say the patients can't handle it. And I think our patients are showing us that, that that's just not true. And just as Gil opened up at, um, at Keck, opened up their program for, to include the psychiatry and psychology and the other uh, mental health and behavioral health notes, that is really admirable to do that because it's a hard thing. There's a lot of pushback on that. 
Um, and I, but I would say if we don't do that, it just enforces the stigma that this population can't handle that when in fact they're showing us just the opposite. Um, next, next slide. I'll stop there and that's for questions. Thank you.